Okay, so hopefully you're seeing slides again. So like I said, this next segment of the day is focused on how to run the program. What are the logistics for you as a teacher? What does it look like in your classroom? And kind of how do you navigate this thing? So let's get back in. Uh, like I said, we provide a lot of teacher support, right? So you can always get a hold of me um, via email or phone um, in my little little address line on my emails is my new cell phone. I have a work cell phone now, so you can get a hold of me um, even by text message or whatever you need to. I, you know, I look at that obviously between eight and five every day, but, you know, it tends to lay around my house. And if I'm bored at 10 p.m. when my husband's watching something, I don't care about I'll answer emails then. So um, easy to get a hold of me definitely during business hours on that cell phone and, you know, via email. Um, there is a Facebook Closed group, like I have said, and again, if you, you know, the only time you can get in to check on fish is midnight on a Saturday and you have an issue, post in the Facebook group. People are on and they will answer you. Um, we have a lot of people, like I said, that have been in the program a long time. Some of these teachers, um, you know, 22 years is our longest running teacher. So they know their stuff, they can help. Um, we have a teacher's manual and a curriculum guide. So I sent you a portion of the the manual in your email this week. We call it the startup guide. So it's that piece that kind of primes you to be able to get your tank set up. What equipment do I buy? All of those pieces. So we call that the startup guide. But the teacher manual is, it includes that startup guide information, but also some other information. And then it gets into some demo activities and some of those other pieces. Then we also have um, um, the curriculum guide. So the curriculum guide currently is not printed because it's about 200 pages. So in order to print that, I had to pull other stuff out of your kit. So I figured, you know what, PDFs work. <laughs> so you get a flash drive with that as a PDF and a whole bunch of other resources and copies of the video. And then you get a print copy of the teacher manual, which is about 80 pages. So those pieces will be in what we call our new teacher. And you will get that when you pick up your eggs this fall. Um, if you, and you can definitely tell me after this workshop, and you can change your mind. But if you're not planning to pick up eggs this year and you're planning to do, utilize the virtual tank, um, shoot me an email with a proper shipping address and I'll make sure you get that tank at, or the teacher kit at some point. Everybody else, I will get it to you when we do egg pickup. So I will um, you know, have those with me. I will also have the food for the salmon and I will also have you know, eggs, obviously. So you're gonna get that kit. What the kit includes is one of those rolled up um, banner cutout salmon. And it includes, you know, some um, bits and pieces that would help you um, run some of the activities. So there's like a water test kit. It's a $50 kit. So we'd like to provide that because that might be helpful. Um, some other tidbits to help run activities, some resources for you to help run the program. So, it, you know, it contains a lot of those little bits and pieces. So you'll get that when you pick up your eggs this year. Traditionally, you would have got it at your workshop, obviously. Um, since we are under a spending freeze, I, I cannot buy the posters I normally buy for you guys. So my goal is to, obviously I have a list of who you are. I'm gonna try to uh, purchase those and be able to distribute those next year to you guys and the new teachers next year. So that's kind of my goal. But there's a couple posters coming down the pipe. Um, if you want to purchase them yourself, they're not terribly expensive and they're all av available in the Michigan Sea Grant um, bookstore. There's like a watershed map of Michigan and you know, like a river system map of Michigan, and those are what we normally provide. So um, if you see those listed in the guide, that's where those are from, is Michigan Sea Grant. There's digital versions online that you could always project on your screen. So hopefully I can buy them next year and distribute them, and I'll catch you guys up. Um, so some other resources we have available are the um, Salmon Sense newsletter. So again, if you have not been getting that, um, make sure you whitelist that MIDNR at gov delivery email and um, you can also send me like a personal email you know a gmail account and i can add that so you get the newsletter so make sure you're getting that newsletter and um then we have the salmon in the classroom website so we'll review that in a second which has lots of resources the website is getting overhauled this winter so it'll have a new look next spring but it should be laid out pretty similarly and then we have how-to videos. Um, and I talked about the virtual option. One of the benefits of that is that I'll be able to add a lot of videos this year. So there'll be more and more and more and we have our own playlist now. So this is what the um, website looks like currently. Um, so in the non-application period of the year, this gray bar at the top will have kind of news in it. So it'll either say application period has ended or you know apply now, those type of, you know, interesting statements that you might need to know right this second. 
Um, and then if you scroll down, we have kind of two sections and she actually just changed the way this looked after I did screenshots, but um, new teacher section, which is obviously what you are and you've done the bits and pieces in here, applied for your scientific collector's permit, all of those things. And then below that is current SIC participants, which you are now. At the end of today, you graduate and you now are in that section. Um, the requirements, timeline and forms piece um, is important. So if you ever are like, how do I get that permit thing? Or where do I find the stocking report? Or where do I find the fish loss form? They're under that tab, right? If you ever need a reminder of requirements and timelines, it's gonna be under that. The second one is curriculum connections and workshop materials, and we'll see that in a second. And then caring for your classroom has um, videos. So here's that requirement, timelines and forms. And again, it gives you all those timelines, when things are due, what is due, all of those bits and pieces. The next is curriculum connections and workshop materials. So up at the top, you'll see a section for the guide and activities. So the very first one is that teacher guide that you're gonna get a print copy of. But if I ever update it, you can download the brand new PDF here. And I always put it in the newsletter, drop it on Facebook. Oh, hey, we have a new version. Um, I actually was gonna do a new version this year, but because of the spending freeze, I ran with the old one because I still had some copies. So um, there'll be some updates coming to that, trying to make your life easier but the PDF will be available online, but you'll have that print copy of this current version. The next one is the Sam in the Classroom Activities Guide. Again, this is only available as a PDF or here online, and it includes currently, I think, 30 different activities that are all correlated with NGSS. Thank you, Leah, my intern, who's been helping answer questions. <laughs> and then um, it also is gonna have some new ones. So I wrote some new lessons but I didn't wanna break the link. So it's currently the old version and then I'll be rolling out some of these new lessons over the course of this year. One of which happens to be an epidemiology based lesson that I wrote like, you know, last summer. So well before COVID, which happens to be terribly applicable right now. So um, that one will be available soon. And I'm also gonna be doing live programs about that epidemiology later, you know, in next semester. So keep an eye out for that. Um, here's that startup guide we talked about that I already emailed to you. We have aquatic invasive species enrichment activities. Very specifically, there's six activities here. So if you need some invasive species stuff, grab that. Um, that video I showed you earlier is right here. Uh, Michigan Fishing is catching on as a pamphlet that's aimed at students. It teaches them how to tie knots and identify some basic fish and some things about fishing. And then some PowerPoints that go along with some activities. And then um, if you ever raise crayfish in your classroom, um, this red swamp crayfish piece is important to look at. Those are an invasive species. They're now established in Michigan in a couple places, and we don't want them here. But a lot of the times the way they get here is through the scientific biological supply route, um, pet stores, and then these guys in particular for food. So keep an eye out for them. Um, the next section down is workshops, presentations, and resources. So what is currently there, these are the PowerPoints from last year. So each one separated out. I'm kind of of running it as one giant PowerPoint today, but they'll be separated out so you can see those. And then also the video segments from today will be posted here in um, a playlist and then some links. So if you need any of these resources to share with co-teachers, um, you know, students that are kind of taking a more leading role, definitely go here and grab what you need. It's all open, um, you know, people from other states borrow our stuff. So it's definitely for everyone to use and take advantage of and learn from. That other section it has those videos. Um, the current videos are, um, I lovingly refer to them as retro. <laughs> they, they were made, you know, 15 some years ago with, you know, meh equipment. So these are the ones that I will be slowly replacing. And these will all have links to either a playlist or to direct videos um, on these different items. The one I'm actually, I was filming this week is how to reseal a tank. So uh, the silicone in the corner of your tank actually um, devolves over time, it gets worn out. And uh, so what I've been doing, I have to run a tank at home to be able to do the virtual option this year. And it was a 90 gallon tank that I used to have in my living room. I replaced it with another tank that I resealed and redid the stand of, but uh, it's been hanging out in my barn. So I've been stripping the silicone seals out. I've been cleaning the tank, putting new seals in, and then gonna water test it. And I've filmed all of that so that I'll have a video of when do I need to think about resealing my tank? How the heck do I do it? You also can pay people to do it, so don't worry about that. Um, but there's there's kind of a lifespan on that silicone. So you wanna make sure you keep an eye on it. Um, some of these teachers have been in 15 years and they use the same tank. That tank is about 20 years old. 
and now I'm finally redoing the silicone. So it lasts quite a while, but if you start seeing damage to that silicone, it's time to think about resealing it. Otherwise you might come in one day and all the water's on the floor. So um, something like that to think about, but those will be the type of YouTube videos that'll be populating that. How to do tank maintenance, how to clean your tank, how to clean your siphon, because they get funky. Um, how to feed the fish, you know, a lot of those different bits and pieces. And then I'll also be doing more educational content, like lesson style recordings as well. So those will start populating soon, as soon as I get through, um, you know, egg pickup and all this chaos. So um, then that gets us into the teacher guide itself. So the teacher guide, um, like I said, you'll get a printed copy of this. It's about 80 pages and um, it is you know, updated on the fly every year. So the PDF version online will always be the current one, but you'll have one that you can run the program with for sure. Um, the updates I make to it usually is new equipment. Maybe there's some new equipment that's been released that makes your life easier or, um, you know, slight changes in partners or offerings for like release days, things like that. So nothing super major. I did a huge major overhaul when I was hired three years ago and now it's pretty set in stone. So you can kind of just roll with that version. So here's kind of how the program works. So you guys obviously went through the application phase. Um, if you have coworkers or friends that are interested in the program, that is open January 1st through April 15th each year. And we accept about 25 new teachers into the program every year. So um, it is a competitive process. Sometimes we get three times the applications that we can handle. Those applications need to be quite thorough. So, you know, the more answers you have, the better the answers are, the more points you get type of system. But so we accept those 25 teachers. Then we hope they go out and try to find sponsors. As you know, the tanks are not cheap, the chiller's not cheap, that equipment's expensive. So finding sponsors in the community, many of which are like Trout Unlimited chapters, um, steel header chapters, local wildlife groups, um, local bait shops or pet stores, Sometimes it's like community foundations or grant based, but we're hoping we're finding some funding so that you can get this off the ground at your school. This time of year is when you need to set up your tank. So every year in mid-October, you need to get your tank set up and get some water in it and get your filter running. You don't necessarily need to start your chiller yet because warm water actually grows that good bacteria quicker. And we're gonna go over that later, but um, you can set your tank up this time of year and it starts what we call cycling. It starts building up that good bacteria. Then in mid-November, um, you have this workshop normally, and then you pick up your eggs at the end of the day. As a returning teacher next year, what you're gonna do is have um, your permit will be emailed to you by November 1st every year. Our admin, Polly Gray, is the one that does that. So when you get emails from a mysterious Polly, that's who that is. She handles like our database and all the permits. And she's feisty, so you better turn your stuff in or you get a nasty gram from Polly. But um, the teacher professional development and egg pickup is in mid-November. And the regular egg pickup corresponds with that. So as a returning teacher, you would have that permit either on your phone or a paper copy in your hand. You'd bring um, a small cooler a small ice pack and usually like a little Tupperware dish or some cardboard just to keep the eggs up off the ice. It's not really to hold the eggs because they're in a Ziploc baggie, but it's to keep them from touching the ice. And you go to one of our egg pickup locations, you show your permit, I check you off a list and I hand you eggs. So that's how it normally goes. This year, same thing. You're gonna get your permit by email by November 1st. Um, you're gonna select one of those egg pickup sites and then uh, you show up with your cooler, your ice pack, your little Tupperware dish, and your permit. You show me, I check you off the list, and you go. You're just going to happen to wear a mask and do all those things while you do it. And you're going to do that every year. So pretty easy. Then it comes to, you know, taking care of them in your classroom. So you're rearing them in your classroom. You're keeping them happy. You're keeping them alive. Um, you're taking advantage of all those classroom activities and incorporating this in your, to your curriculum. Then you start planning your release event. And we're going to talk about that later but um, you release in April or May, you have kind of a wide range of options on what you wanna do and it's totally up to you. You select one of those locations off of our map and then you release. Um, this year, you know, having students or lots of students with you might be iffy. So it can be a little different than it'll be in the future, but um, you start planning that release date kind of early and get that date on the calendar. So in the teacher guide, there is also a timeline. So this again is a good one to look at. This is one that does get updated every once in a while as things change, but um, the most current one will always be in that PDF online, but there is a copy in your, PD or your printed copy that is darn close to accurate always. So you 
kind of know what to expect for each month. So like I said, you get those eggs in you know mid-November, then in December they will hatch, and then about a month after they hatch, they absorb their yolk sac and you start feeding them. When they are 80% buttoned up is what we call it. So when 80% 80 of, 80 of the fish in your tank have absorbed their little bellies, um, that's when you start to train them to eat food. And when I say train, I mean like four granules at a time um, because they're kind of dumb in the first week of feeding them, they just don't quite get it. And you don't wanna put too much food in there because it falls at the bottom and makes a mess and messes with your water quality. So teeny tiny bits just to get them to go, oh, hey, food in front of my face, must hit food, eat food. Um, in January, now they're starting to get decent at eating. They're starting to get bigger. They're starting to um, create waste, right? Because they're eating more. So you have to start doing more water changes and keeping an eye on your water parameters. February, March, they're getting bigger and bigger. You got to do those water changes. Um, you got to change the amount and which size of feed, and that's all labeled for you. It's super easy. And then you get to where you're testing water quality, siphoning debris, um, and you have some big, huge, healthy fish in April and May. And then you pick those release dates. So the release in the lower peninsula is between April 15th and May 15th. In the upper peninsula, it's April 15th through May 30th because it's colder up there, right? Sometimes the ice hasn't moved out yet. So anywhere in that range, you can pick whatever date you want and um, you release in one of those pre-approved streams and um, off your little fishies go. So um, in the Q&A, how many people have set up their tank already? Has anybody set it up yet? Or is anybody looking for kind of help or expertise on how to do that? Because I can kind of modify what I talk about with this slide and the next couple. Oh, no one's piping in yet. So um, maybe it takes a second. So this is kind of the holy grail of tank setups. So yours does not need to look like this. Way simpler uh, setups work, but this is kind of a good photogenic setup. This is the one at that zoo like I was talking. So um, the things you have to have, you have to have a tank. We recommend 75 gallons or larger. 55 gallons is a minimum and you want the tank to be longer then it is wide or deep, right? You want a nice long tank so those fish have some swimming room in there. You want two sponge filters. That's what these are. They're literally black sponge, kind of circular. And they um, have a home for lots of good bacteria, right? So what these sponges do is you take your airline off your air pump, which is right here. You run the airline up the back, down through the plastic tube, and it hooks to the sponge filter. You can even take this gray portion apart that's in the center. And um, inside, you can add a tiny nub of air hose and one of those little air stones, and it makes smaller bubbles. Um, that is nice if you have students that feel the need to go to the bathroom if they listen to water bubbling all day. Um, making smaller bubbles kind of reduces that noise, so that's good. Um, but these two sponge filters hook to your airline and they provide tons of surface area for all of um, that good bacteria, right? So you want that bacteria surface area up here. And what you do with these sponges is once a month, you take out one sponge and rinse it and get all the muddy water out of it. So you take, and then the next time you do this sponge, you can do it every two weeks up to a month. At the end of the year, you're gonna definitely wanna do it every two weeks because they get big and dirty. Um, so these ones um, are pretty low maintenance and they don't go bad. You can use the same sp sponge filter for a decade. You know you need to replace it if you squeeze it and it doesn't go back to its original shape or chunks of it start coming off, but it takes a long time. This filter is like 15 bucks. It's not bad at all. You buy two of those, hook them to your airline. And I actually, my daughter's tank, she has a 75 gallon in her room and I have one little power head with a tiny filter and, and one of these and that runs her whole tank. Um, a lot of pet stores run tanks off just sponge filters. But then again, you are gonna have to have 150 poop machines. So you want as much filtration as you can possibly get. And I always say, definitely um, over filter the daylights out of your tank. And the best way to do that is to have these two sponge filters, but then also have a canister filter. So this one is an FX4 made by Fluval, but there's a brand called Eheim, E-H-E-I-M, that also makes really good canister filters. Um, but those are the two recommended by our aquarium 
store experts. But so this canister filter has a black tube that goes up and here's the intake in your tank. Then another tube goes to your chiller, which is this big box. The water goes through the chiller, gets chilled, goes up the pipe and then back in the tank over here. Um, this filter itself is made for a 250 gallon tank which is great considering, again, you have 150 four inch poop machines. Um, if you walked into an aquarium store and we're gonna buy fish, the standard rule of thumb is one inch of fish for one gallon of water. So if you bought a 29 gallon tank, you can have 29 inches of fish is kind of the equation. Well, think about it. You guys have a 75 gallon tank and you have a 150 four inch fish. That is a lot of mass of fish in a small tank if they all survive, which we don't expect them to. But um, having a 250 gallon filter plus two sponge filters helps keep up with that. And it makes your life way easier. The more filtration you have, the better off you are because you have to do less water quality. Um, so what you have is that canister filter, an inline chiller is what this called, those two sponge filters and an air pump is the crucial equipment. A light is a bonus. That's only for you and your students. So having a light is just so you can see the fish. The fish don't care if they have light. They like it if it's dark. <laughs> um, so if you have a light, definitely put it on a timer and run the light as little as possible. The more it runs, potentially you stress your fish, but you also can grow algae in your tank that you don't want to deal with. So have your light on as little as possible and um, keep it on a timer. I had a, a teacher that was having some issues. She lost all of her fish but one and they could not figure out her why. And she was working with the local pet store with water tests and doing treatments and figuring it out. There was zero reason she should have lost her fish. Um, her water parameters were right on. The temperature was correct. Her oxygen levels were great. We could not figure it out. And what, what happened was her tank is in the media center because they use it for multiple classrooms. And the librarian had always turned on the light mid-morning and turned it off in the afternoon for years and years and years. She's been in the program a long time. Um, they got a new librarian. She retired and they replaced her. The new lady didn't know that. And the light was on 24 seven. Um, and basically between that and the traffic from students and all the other bits and pieces, we think it basically just stressed the fish to death. So keeping that light on a timer, I think is a crucial piece um, using you know, ambient light in your classroom through your windows. Someone just asked that question. That's great. You might get some algae growth from that. Um, but again, that's, you know, keeping them on a natural cycle. That's awesome. Um, you can do a small light for a big tank. You know, you can kind of mess around with it what you need. Only have the students turn the light on if they're going to go and observe the fish. Teachers handle it different ways. Um, some people put them on timers and have it click on for the hours of the day that the kids need to look in the tank. And then the other hours can look into a darkened tank. So run it how you need to. Um, if you are putting your tank on a stand like this, make sure you have good ventilation. Like I said, you get some condensation. Um, these chillers and um, filters run pretty hot. So there's an exhaust fan in here pulling air out of the stand and keeping cool air coming in. Um, some people cut out the panels in their stands and put some of that fancy metal mesh so that better airflow gets in. Some people just put the chiller outside the stand up on a counter or right next to it. Some people, and I saw this question, um, run their tank on a lab counter in their classroom. The big thing with doing that is talk to your maintenance staff and see if that counter can support it or if they need to add some boards underneath to help support it. This tank, you know, a gallon of water weighs eight pounds, plus you have the glass tank and all the equipment and all the things. So that is a ton of weight. Um, you know, you have 800 pounds of weight sitting on that four foot chunk of counter. So just be sure that that counter is strong enough to hold it. But we definitely have teachers that run it that way. Like I said, simpler setups are totally fine. Um, some people also run chillers. It's called a drop in chiller where you have a box that sits outside the tank with a kind of a tube. And then you have metal coils that kind of lay against the back of your tank and the coils are what help chill the tank. Um, so you know, either style chiller is fine. This one hooks to your canister filter, which is nice. And um, these ones are quieter, but they run a little hotter. The external ones with those metal coils are loud, but cooler. So it depends on, you know, what you need in your classroom, right? So these are all very cool things that you can add onto your tank. And in the startup guide, you'll see there's kind of a comparison of the types of equipment and what you need. I kind of set it up as like a choose your own adventure, right? So um, definitely take a peek at all those bits and pieces. So, oh, someone got their stuff from Pruce. 
and uh oh he and she got one of the acrylic trays to go underneath one of the drip trays which is awesome yeah reef figures it's about a thousand pounds for his setup so they're not light right these are heavy heavy tanks so just be sure whatever you're putting it on can accommodate that um you do need glass lids so there's glass lids in here with the front it's got like a little hinge and it opens up to feed the fish um lids are important for a couple reasons one it helps keep the cool in you know doesn't uh, let it evaporate as much but also salmon like to jump right even the little baby dudes so make sure the whole top of your tank is covered don't cut openings for your like filter stuff too big have them nestle right up against the tubes because these little buggers jump and they'll jump right out of your tank and you'll find little crusty dried salmon on your floor so make sure you have glass lids you can also weight the lids so a lot of the teachers put like the bin of food sitting on the lid so they can't bounce it open or like encyclopedias you know because those don't get used for anything else anymore. Um, something to weigh down the glass lids is important. And then canopies are handy. So this particular canopy at the zoo actually has baby locks on it, magnetic baby locks. So no one can open the tank and mess with the fish. Um, doors down here have locks on them so that students and kids can't mess with the equipment. So if that's something you think you have a concern with, definitely make sure you have some way to protect your equipment and you know keep people from mucking with your tank. Um, the problem we usually have is friendly people helping to feed fish, um, which you don't want them to do. We have to prescribe a very specific amount of fish and um, we have to make sure that they're only eating that small quantity. Underfeeding fish is always better than overfeeding. So you don't want friendly, friendly custodians adding, you know, pounds of fish to your fish food to your tank. Another thing to think about is your power strip back here. You want your power strip mounted up higher than your outlet and have the cord hanging down and then going to your outlet. So that's called a drip um, curve. So you have that drip spot in the wire. So if water ever ran on that, it's going to drip off and not go in the outlet and not go on your power strip. And the same thing with the cords you want. So like the cord from the light, you want it to go down, hang lower and then go up to the outlet strip because you want the water to drip off it before it goes into that socket. Um, if your power strip or your outlet is outside your your stand get baby proof covers for them and mount laminated signs to them that say do not unplug life support for fish that happens so often you know the teacher goes on christmas break um custodians are waxing the floors they see this power strip plugged in well teacher's not here so they unplug it plug in their buffer and then do not plug it back in and teacher comes back to dead fish. So I always make sure to label the outlet itself with a big sign, cover up those outlets with a baby lock and a sign. And then they make um, baby locks for the outlet strips too, where you can't um, unplug things on accident. We had one where like somebody kicked a cord and they didn't know it and like the pump turned off and it was really bad. So I always make sure to have those protections in place, have signs. And then the other thing is, um, you know, you can mount a sign next to your tank kind of saying what the tank should look like. So it should say, you should see bubbles coming out of the sponge filters. You should see water flowing out of the filter, you know, into this filter and out of that filter. The easiest way to do that is to, you know, put one of those little fake plants in here and have it blow around. If it's moving, water's moving, right? Um, if they open the doors, there should be a red light on the front of your chiller and it should say a temperature and that temperature should be close to 52 degrees right um this thing should be making noise and water should be moving out of it you know all of those kind of pieces you can hang a sign next to your tank so it, if a custodian or another teacher or a substitute happens to be by your tank and they're like oh there's no bubbles coming out of these they can get a hold of you and you know help remedy the problem because you don't want the fish life support turning off right so this is kind of the tank setup um another piece is you know nets and siphons and things like that i saw somebody has you know uh, saltwater tanks and freshwater tanks already in their classroom um you don't want to mix equipment the filter for or the um, net for this is the net for this you don't put it on anything else you don't stick it in any other water that's gonna uh, lessen the disease transfer so you want that to happen for sure and then you um want to have your other equipment be as separate as possible so if you have a siphon for your classroom and you use it on multiple tanks, try to disinfect it between tanks. Um, I go from highest risk tank to lowest risk tank. So when I do tanks at my house, um, I do my daughter's 29 gallon first because it's a small system with small filters. Then I do my other daughter's 75 gallon. Then I do the 150 in the living room. Um, the salmon tank is going to live in my garage next to you know my workout equipment and it's going to have its own siphon, its own nets. 
and it's not going to commingle with my other tanks. I'm going to keep it all separate. So those are important pieces to think about because you don't want to transfer a disease from your goldfish tank, which are like, you know, the dirty little fish of the world, to your healthy salmon tank. So just try to keep equipment separate and keep that all happy. And again, you usually can find sponsors um, or local support for, you know, equipment like that if you need to purchase a second set. So um, any questions on the setup itself? So this one says, how did you connect the filter to the chiller with the different size hoses? So basically, um, the easiest way to do that is to unhook this little piece on the Fluval chiller or the Eheim chiller. So this black and red piece here pops off. Oh, I probably should share it again. Sorry, hang on. Because I forgot I put it on me. Um, are you seeing it okay? So the, um, the little valve here, if you pop that off, it's got a barb. And then if you either take or um, measure this barb here, take those two pieces to a local mom and pop hardware store and say, I need to connect this to this. Um, and they will help you get the appropriate barbs and hose and hose clamps. Um, you can go to Home Depot and get it. Yep, Reese just put that in there. They're not quite as helpful I've found at Home Depot, but like a mo local mom and pop hardware or plumbing supply place, like they will be happy to hook you up. They'll sell you two feet of tubing rather than 25 feet, right? They'll, they'll cut a chunk off for you and they'll get the adapters you need, but that's what you need. So you just need to adapt from here to there with a small chunk of tube. And then the tube coming off here, you may need to adapt depending on what filter and what kind of thing you have. Um, this side is set in stone because this is the part that comes with the filter. So. Those are the pieces you want to get. And it takes a tiny bit of plumbing knowledge. And again, you might find a plumber in town that's super revved and wants to help you. Um, and they will help you adapt this really quickly. So um, a lot of times husbands, spouses, dads, father-in-laws, you know, moms, cousins get pulled in to help with stuff like this if they have this expertise. So take advantage of who you know. Um, the other bit of maintenance advice is if you have this chiller or even the one that's the coil chiller in the tank, um, these, can be serviced, but it's not by who you might think. So you might think like an HVAC person, which some of them can help, but that's not necessarily their expertise. Um, the person you want to bug is the people that service the pop dispensers, those chilled pop dispensers that have the ice maker up in the top. They know how to fix this unit, like for sure. Um, this is exactly the type of thing that they service and know well. So if you ever have issues with your inline chiller especially, that's who you want to call is somebody that um, services those refrigerated pop dispensers. But a lot of the brands of chiller have a little trapdoor next to the power cord that houses a spare fuse. And if you have a problem with your chiller, nine out of 10 times, it's because you need to replace that fuse. So if yours does have a fuse that may need to be replaced, I suggest buying a couple spares and throwing them in your desk drawer, just so you have them. They're super cheap, but they're not necessarily the easiest thing to find on the fly. So find it, order it, throw them in your desk drawer and have some spares on hand. But usually that is the problem. Another issue is that you need to vacuum the coils back here. They just get gunked up with dust bunnies. So make sure you, um, have that clean and clean it often, right? So those are two big tidbits. So some questions just popped in, so let's answer those. Um, so the filter or the chiller come first on the line. So you want the filter intake to go to the filter, it filters the water, then it goes into your chiller and then gets expelled into the tank. That's how you want it set up. You don't want um, water with debris going through your chiller because that just makes a mess. So you're filter will catch the debris or the extra fish food or whatever it may be and then it sends clean water to your chiller it it cools it and then puts it back in the tank um, another tidbit i suggest especially at the beginning of the year is this intake cover it with cheesecloth or you know a net or something some sort of material that reduces the size because it'll suck up the eggshells as the fish are hatching but it'll also suck up baby fish if they're not good swimmers yet. So um, covering it with cheesecloth that you can take off and throw away if it gets yucky for the first like month or so um, is a really good idea. And it helps reduce the flow just a tiny bit, keeps those baby fish out of there, but it also keeps the debris out of there because that debris gets in your filter and just makes dirty water. So the more you can pull off right here and throw away, the better off you are. Um, the other question, 
the fuses for the coil chillers. Most brands of coil chillers do not have a fuse as far as I know, but definitely read your manual and check that. Um, yeah, so the chiller transfers the heat and they do have to have very good ventilation. So make sure the end panels are cut out, you have good fans, you don't want those to overheat. If they um, consistently overheat, it reduces their lifespan greatly. This is a $600 thing, you want it to last a long time. So definitely make sure they have really good ventilation. Um, someone asked about how high calcium content and starting it with distilled or filter. That's up to you. Um, so I always use the Wolf Lake Hatchery as an example. So, you know, people are like, my water is super hard. Like, how are they going to survive? Or I have high calcium, whatever it is. Um, the water at Wolf Lake is like off the charts for hardness, and they raise millions of fish a year. So um, the hardness isn't as big a problem as stability. So you want stable hardness and stable pH. Bad pH is bad. Um, and if you get, you know, uh, messed up pH is bad. My water at my house is crazy hard. And like I said, I have three tanks, soon to be four. No issues with the hard water. Um, just know your source. So maybe they're running it through a water softener before you're using it, or maybe you can find a spigot that doesn't go through a water softener if you need to. Test your source water. So test the water coming out of the faucet and maybe try a different faucet. Maybe you have better options. You know, maybe it's going through a softener someplace else. So that's something to consider. Um, some people purchase water. So like Proust Pets, our big pet store here in Lansing, um, they sell water. It's pre-treated. Um, the chlorine's removed. That's all good, right? So you buy those five-gallon jugs of water. They're pretty cost-effective. And if you can find sponsors to help fund that, you know, you get yourself a little cart where you can roll them right to the tank, and then you can get a cheap pump for like 10 bucks and some tubing to pump the water out of that thing up into your tank so you don't even have to pick it up, and you can put clean water in that way. Um, other people get reverse osmosis systems, especially if your pH is messed up, or you have really soft water. Um, the best way to fix that is with a reverse osmosis system. And you can get them for a few hundred dollars. We have a suggested brand and model that works pretty well for these types of tanks that mounts under the sink type of thing. Um, you would have filter replacement costs with that. So again, a good one to get a sponsor for. But reverse osmosis systems, maintenance guys can easily install it and then you can have a reverse osmosis water. You don't ever wanna fill the tank with just RO water because it doesn't have the minerals and stuff in it and those fish need that. So um, you kind of have to do an equation of how much faucet water and how much RO water gives you good water parameters. And it's totally different for everybody. So it might be 75% faucet water and 25% reverse osmosis or vice versa. You know, it totally depends on your water. But if you have crazy water parameters, that is the number one easiest way to fix it is to get an RO system or find a local source of RO or distilled water in five gallon jugs. One of my teachers has horrid water at her school um, and I think she's in Rochester Hills. And um, one some local source donates the five gallon jugs of distilled water for her for the year. So you can find those, you know, hit people up. The nice part about this program is we have a large charismatic fish that people think is super cool. So if they get to come in and see your tank and help feed the fish once, they'll donate stuff, they'll help, right? Um, a lot of people like to do that. So how does the canister filter work and where does the output go if you have the other type of chiller? Um, so this canister filter, that's what this is called. And it, you know, here's the intake, there's the outflow. It's just tubes that run up the back of the tank. Um, some people have hang on the back filters. So it's a little black box looking thing that kind of hangs on the back part of the tank and it has an intake here. And then water kind of goes over a waterfall to fall back in the tank. Those totally work. But again, oversize it. So get two or huge ones or get two huge ones, right? That filter hundred gallons each. And the problem with hang on the back filters is they have filter pads that slide into them and you have to replace those like every two weeks um, and even more so at the end of the year. Well, those cost money. So you're constantly spending money on new filter material. Um, the benefit of the canister filters is that they can have what's called permanent media. It's not necessarily permanent, forever permanent, but you don't have to change it all the time. So they have little ceramic doodads, cylinders or balls or things like corrugated looking balls that are almost the size of a ping pong ball. Those are permanent media. So they're basically surface area for that good bacteria to live on. You can put those, there's trays in those canister filters and you put that permanent media in the tray and it makes your filter much more low maintenance and lower cost to maintain. 
right? So the, the canister chilter to buy is more expensive at the start, but over its lifespan, it's more effective, it's more efficient, and it's less costly because you don't have to constantly change those filter pads. What I recommend is with the canister filter, take out a third of your permanent media every fall and replace it with new. So just in case it's clogged up with debris or whatever else, you have some new substrate in there for that good bacteria, but that's the only maintenance you should have to do on it. At the end of the year, you flush them, you clean your substrate, you let it dry, throw them on a shelf. That's all you have to do with that filter at the end of the year. To get it kicked back up, you put all that dry media back in, close it up, hook it up, run water in it, you're good to go. So they're very easy to maintain. Those hang on the back filters sometimes clog, sometimes the water won't fall over the little waterfall. Um, you know, there's some more maintenance to those, but they're visible. So that's another thing is like, if you need that visual cue of like, oh yeah, I need to change that filter, um, hang on the back filters are nice for that. I always recommend it, no matter which one you have, the hang on the back or the canister, always have two sponge filters, at least. More is better, but two is nice. And buy like sponge filters for 100 gallon tanks. So you have two 100 gallon sponge filters in there. And that's a ton of good surface area for bacteria. Okay, let's see one more. Um, oh, someone just got a chiller from a local steelheaders group. The cord that attaches to the coil has ice and frost building up on it. Ooh. Um, figure out what brand it is and call the company and they'll tell you cover the tube with pipe insulation or put this on it or run it this way or maybe you need to back flush it or something. So get a hold of the company and ask them and they're usually pretty good at helping out, um, especially if it's like the Glacier or Artica chillers um, because they're used to answering questions from fish people. <laughs> Some of the brands of chillers are made for um, aquaponics systems. And those brands, usually, if you call, they have no idea how to help with aquarium stuff. Um, those ones are also cheaper, and they're, like, identical. So if you haven't bought your chillers yet, um, horrible story, but I had to, uh, I had a teacher that had a chiller failure once, and he called me at, like, a Friday night freaking out because his chiller died. And he is a priest at the Catholic school and teaches, you know, the salmon in the classroom program. I had to tell a priest to go to the shady part of town to visit the um, grow shop to purchase a new chiller um, because them and they're on the shelf and they have weirder hours right so he goes to the grow shop he buys the chiller and he gets an installed fixes his tank and on monday he calls me he's like they were so nice and helpful and but it's it's a good thing to know those are usually more cost effective um they have different hours they're available in most towns you might not have a pet store but you probably have one of those um so anywhere selling aquaponics stuff usually has those chillers as well so keep that in mind okay so let's Hop back over here and we'll get into the eggs and how we get the eggs. And I'm going to try playing that video one more time so it might go, you know, like actually seamless this time. So let's see. Okay. So I said we collect our eggs at a weir. So our Chinook salmon eggs all come from the Little Manistee River weir. So this is the Little Manistee River. And here is the weir system. So it's kind of like a fence in the river. Um, that's how I describe it to kids. So the piece above is kind of like a catwalk. And then in the river are grates that are kind of like a fence. So the river, um, the fish swim up the river here and they kind of bump into that fence and it div diverts them up a fish ladder and this channel here and into these holding ponds. So the holding ponds um, is where we let the fish mature or ripen is the, is the biology word. So the fish, you know, obviously have the urge to spawn. Their bodies just might not be quite ready. So we look for a ripeness factor, you know, getting over 75, over 80. 80% 80 of the fish in there are ripe. That means they're ready to spawn. And that's when we go into our spawning activities that we watched in that video. So this is the facility. Um, you see there's a big like boardwalk deck here. There's picnic tables back in here. You can actually tour this. There's actually a school bus in this picture. Um, people are doing tours inside the weir, but also outside the weir. We lead those tours as our education staff and the fishery staff are the ones in the building um, doing the egg take. But that's something you can actually do a field trip to and see if you're somewhat near Manistee area. Um, we schedule those on Sign Up Genius in the fall. So next fall, you'll see a sign up for that go out and you can sign up to take your students up there. You can also take them out there without signing up. You just don't get the educator program, but you can give the tour yourself. So the egg tech operations are open to the public, but except this year, um, but they are kind of on a random schedule. So it's all based on the fish. 
the fish do what they want, right? So um, this year was a really good example. The run was very early and very good and very large. Um, they had more than enough fish almost from one day of egg takes. Normally they start probably the second week of October and they do egg takes for two or three weeks, two or three days a week. Um, so, the, you know, Tuesdays and Wednesdays are the likely days and usually starting you know, October 7th, 8th. Um, and the biggest egg takes usually like the second week. One of those days we have MSU Fish Health there taking specimens to do the fish health inspections that are required. And, you know, we spawn all the fish based on their ripeness and, you know, how many fish are in those holding ponds and all of that. This year, there were a zillion fish very early and we were done on like the 2nd of October or something. It was so early this year and such a good run. So um, now it's the the watch and see game of the quality of those eggs. So we had a year a couple years ago where the run was okay, but the eggs were really big for salmon eggs. And um, the survival rate was much lower that year. And it was just the egg quality was not as good. It had been a really hot summer. The run was okay-ish and the survival rate in the eggs wasn't great. And that transfers to you guys. So when there's a bad survival rate in the hatchery, that transfers to you and you'll have a potentially bad survival rate. Um, same thing with like illnesses in fish. And But we um, do a lot of ensuring the genetics. So the fish are paired one-to-one. -one, so one male, one female. So um, the female spawns those 5,000 eggs. You fertilize it with the male's mint, milt. And then those get mixed in five gallon buckets with multiple male and female combos. Then those buckets get mixed again at the hatchery in the trays. Um, so that within a tray of eggs, it's, you know, 20 different males and females potentially, or five different males and females. So the genetic diversity is kind of mixed up. And then we pull eggs from those trays for you guys. So hopefully you're not getting all from one fish um, or one pairing and you're getting some genetic diversity. So hopefully those effects are diluted a little bit. Um, we did have last year. So one option in returning years for you guys, once you're experienced, is to collect green eggs at that weir. So green eggs are eggs that were spawned today. They were just fertilized. You come pick them up right now, on the fly, of course, because we don't know when those dates are gonna be, and take them back and acclimate them to your tank. But you get to see that first month of fertilization. So we give you twice as many eggs, expecting half of them to die. Um, and you get to watch them eye up and then the rest of the phase. That is much more risky because we don't know the health of those eggs yet and we don't know um, how they're gonna survive. So if all your eggs die, you'll have to fill out a fish loss report and then you'll have to drive to one of the hatcheries and get replacement eggs. So it's kind of more rigmarole, but it's cool if you have that opportunity to um, show that first month of development if you're somewhat close to the Manistee Weir. We have about six to eight teachers that take advantage of that a year, so it's not huge. Um, this year that is not available because of COVID protocols, and then replacement fish are also not available this year because we can't let people into the hatcheries. But on a normal year, both of those things are options. So we're going to watch that video again because it answers the next question I just saw pop up. So let's hop back to our presentation and I'm going to try to play that video again. But um, you'll see in the video, the fertilization process is super quick. So it's about a minute total. So the outside of the egg has pores. Those pores open up um, to let the sperm in, the milt that goes in and they seal up within a minute. Then we harden them with a saltwater solution, a saline solution that helps really tighten up those pores and make them a little bit more sturdy. And then we can rinse them with the antibacterial stuff and we can dump them in those five gallon buckets and we can drive those five gallon buckets back to the hatchery. So in those first two, 24 hours after they harden up, they're pretty sturdy. Then once they start to develop, they get weaker and weaker until they hit that eyed egg phase, then they're sturdy again. So that's why we hand out the eggs when we do. We have to wait that month so that they'll be sturdy before um, we get to that phase, right? Since the 1960s, Chinook salmon have become an important piece of the puzzle that is the $7 billion per year Great Lakes fishery. But the story doesn't start here. Chinook salmon were introduced to the Great Lakes in the 1960s thanks to eggs from salmon in their home range of the Pacific Northwest. To supplement wild populations, the Michigan Department of Natural Resources maintains a salmon rearing program in our state fish hatcheries. In their native habitat, they are anadromous, migrating from rivers to the Pacific Ocean and back. 
In Michigan, Chinook salmon are patadromous, meaning they travel from rivers to a great lake and then return to their natal rivers as adults, where they then spawn and die. This marks the end of their life cycle. The DNR maintains weirs around the state, which are used to block the upstream migration of fish. The Little Manistee River Weir, located on the river that bears its name, is the main egg take location for Chinook salmon in the state of Michigan. The adult fish are diverted up a fish ladder and into holding ponds where they mature prior to spawning. Staff gather each October to spawn the Chinook. Fish are mechanically crowded into a building and humanely euthanized. Once euthanized, they are checked for ripeness, sorted by sex, and placed in a disinfectant bath of iodine to remove any external pathogens. Fisheries staff make every effort to only spawn wild fish. Those with missing adipose fins are hatchery-reared fish and will not be spawned. Females are then stripped of their eggs, while males are stripped of their milt, or sperm. The 4,000 to 5,000 eggs from one female are fertilized with milt from one male. The fish go through a disease inspection and are then placed in bins for human consumption and pet food. All parts of the fish are harvested and used. No portion is wasted. After the eggs have been fertilized, they are placed in a water bath containing thiamine for a period of one hour. Chinook salmon feed almost exclusively on alewife, which lowers the thiamine level in the salmon. Egg batches are then mixed into five gallon buckets where fresh, clean water provides oxygen. Eggs are disinfected one more time with an iodine solution and then transported back to a state fish hatchery. At the hatchery, green eggs are placed in incubation trays. Water is constantly circulated through every tray, each of which houses 7,500 eggs. Eggs hatch in approximately 45 days and begin living off their yolk sac. At this stage, they are called sac fry or alvin. Upon absorbing their yolk sac during their first month, called buttoning up, the Chinook are transferred to larger tanks as swim up fry. In these tanks, they are provided all their needs of life, including food, water, and shelter. As the young Chinook salmon grow over the winter, their markings become more complex, and they become adept at feeding. At this stage, they are called par. As the par get bigger, they start to lose their camouflage markings and take on a more silvery appearance, which is called smolting. This is the stage where state fish hatcheries begin stocking the fish into rivers around Michigan. Fish are weighed and pumped into stocking trucks, driven to their assigned site, and then released into the water. Some are transferred into holding pens to be fed a little longer, and then they are released. These fish, now with a solid silvery appearance, are called smolts. They will imprint on their natal stream and forage for food. As they grow larger, they will make their way downstream to one of the Great Lakes, where they will live for the next couple years. While in the lake, they consume alewives and other fish swimming in the middle of the water column. They can gain up to 30 pounds in those few years while reaching maturity. Once mature, they will make their way back to their natal stream in the late summer and early fall. This is a great time for anglers to focus on catching a Chinook salmon, either from a boat in the lake or in the stream as they migrate to spawning locations. Once in their natal stream, Chinook salmon migrate until they find the perfect spawning habitat. Females then make a red, or a nest, in the gravel. After spawning, they will die and become part of the river's nutrient cycle, with their young starting the whole process over again. For more information, visit michigan.gov SIC. So this life cycle um, map is a really simple one, but like I made this graphic. So if you see things that are in, you know, our videos or in the teacher guide and you want a copy of it or want a, you know, JPEG of it, you can always let me know because most of this stuff I design myself and I can pull it on the fly and shoot it to you. Um, same thing with PowerPoint. So like I post all the PowerPoints from today, you're welcome to steal them and use them. Steal bits and pieces of them, uh, whatever you need. So it's, it's all for you and, uh, you know, we try to get you what you need. If I don't have it, I try to find it for you. So this is a good example of pieces that um, we've created that you are definitely welcome to use. So so hopefully that made a little bit more sense this time. I always try to show that video twice so that you get the kind of overview and then you can go, oh, that's where that happens. Oh, that's how they do this. 
So um, as we said, you know, they take the eyed egg or the green eggs back to the hatchery and they put them in the trays. Water consistently flows through these trays nonstop the whole time. There's like a mesh screen on the bottom, almost like window screen, and the water flows through the eggs consistently. You'll see that there's white dead eggs in here as he's putting them in there. Um, they let them harden back up because, again, they're really sensitive for that first month. As they hit the eyed egg stage, um, they actually use a contraption. It's like a metal squared off funnel over top of a bucket where they they do a saline wash and soak and they bounce the eggs around that metal funnel and down into the bucket. And any eggs that aren't viable will actually burst when they bump around the metal and they can skim off all the dead eggs and put the clean eggs back in the trays. So it's a super smart way and efficient way to pull those dead eggs. They don't have to sit there with tweezers. Um, when we go to count and bag your eggs, we do sit there with tweezers. The tweezers actually have the tips are twisted into a little circle so that it helps pick up the eggs. They're just plain old like forceps for science lab with a twisted end. And we pick out those white eggs one by one. And then we use that little counting spatula looking thing to uh, count your eggs. So we don't count them by hand, thankfully. But um, last year alone, we counted and bagged 45,000 eggs for you guys. So it's pretty cool how many eggs go through there. Um, but this year, of course, you don't get to see that process quite as up as close. You get to take tours normally and you go in the hatchery and see that. But this year it's not possible. So if you need footage, you can pull from that video clip to show your students. And I have more pictures and fodder if you need it. So in these egg batches, you can see actually the white eggs. Those are dead eggs. So these were fertilized a minute ago and we already have um, dead eggs in the batch. So these are where they're hardening, they're mixing in these batches. This tube actually um, makes water flow over them consistently and overflows the water out of the buckets. But you can already see that there's dead eggs in there. So again, this is why we mix one to one male to female. We call, um, it's usually the male's fault, but we call them duds if they aren't able to fertilize the eggs. Sometimes it's the female's fault, but usually it's the male's. And uh, those white eggs are those dead eggs. So they, they might have been dead inside the female. They might have turned white as we added the saline solution as they hit this bucket. So those are dead eggs. So those are the ones that if you ever see white eggs in your tank, white is bad. Get it out of there right away because you don't want it to decompose and mess up your water quality. With an iodine solution and then transport it back to a state fish hatchery. At the hatchery, green eggs are placed in incubation trays. Water is constantly circulated through every tray, each of which houses 7,500 eggs. Okay, so you see the little spatula thing she has that has little divots in it, and each divot holds an egg, and then we take that spatula and put it in a tray, and the tray mixed with some fresh water you can see coming out of the pipe here is what um, goes in the Ziploc baggies that you guys get. So this is what she was doing here is helping me to count and bag those eggs. So the first thing we do is pull this tray out and pick all the white dead eggs out of it, then we um, count out your 150 eggs, put them in a baggie, and then send them off with you. So that's actually what she's helping with right here. Um, so they're eyed eggs now, and we're counting them for you guys, and you're going to pick them up at one of our egg pickup locations. So one is the Wolf Lake Hatchery in Kalamazoo, and then we have the two hatcheries in the UP as well. So the Marquette Hatchery and Thompson Hatchery, which is in Manistique, well, technically Thompson, but just outside Manistique. So you can pick up eggs at those three facilities. Then we also have three other newer egg pickup locations. So um, we have an egg pickup in Cadillac at the Carl T. Johnson Hunt and Fish Center, which is our DNR education facility there. So a nice central location in Cadillac to pick up eggs. And then we also have a pickup at the Bay City Visitor Center. Our interpreter there actually raises salmon, so he has to come pick up eggs anyway. So I had... Um, talked him into actually running an egg take. So teachers in the thumb, especially as the thumb has become more popular, um, don't have to drive quite as far. And then we have one in the Detroit area. Um, it used to be in Lake Orion at a middle school. Then I started doing workshops in the Detroit area. So it was tied to the workshop. and It was at the uh, Fisheries Research Station on Lake St. Clair. And um, this year, because I don't have to run that workshop, I actually can hold it someplace a little bit more neutral for people um, based on where everybody is. So I'm gonna be in Waterford at the um, research station there, the fishery station in Waterford. So a little bit more central for people, kind of between the different freeways and highways. So, um, but next year I'll be hopefully doing a workshop back in person in at the Metro Beach Nature Center and then egg pickup at the fisheries research station. So this is where you'll go every year, like I said, with a small cooler, a small ice pack, a little piece of cardboard or Tupperware to keep the eggs off the ice, 
and your permit in hand and you just make your appointment via sign up genius each year and show up with your valid permit that you get emailed after November 1st and pick up your eggs. Easy peasy. Um, when you bring them back to your tank, you need to acclimate them. So your tank should be running at 52 degrees. Like I said, you don't have to turn your chiller on right away, but when you do turn it on, adjust it slowly. So set it for room temperature and then adjust it a few degrees each day and get it down to 52 degrees before you get your eggs. You acclimate them by putting the baggie, kind of float it in the water. And every five or 10 minutes, add some water from your tank into the baggie so that they get used to water parameters and the temperature of your tank. And then once the temperature in the bag is the same as out of the bag, you drop them in your tank. We do um, advocate for bare bottom tanks because lots of um, good bacteria can live in gravel, but so can lots of debris and waste and bad bacteria. So because this is not a flowing river system like they have in the wild, we suggest putting them on that bare glass bottom because you don't want them just sitting and stewing in that bacteria, right? So bare bottoms. And um, if you need to, if they're rolling around your tank a little bit too much, sometimes people use like craft stones and wash them really well and kind of make a little ring, a circle of stones and kind of keep the eggs inside that so they don't roll around the whole tank. Um, but you definitely don't want like normal aquarium gravel in your tank and definitely do rounded stones so it doesn't cut up your little guys. So in a couple weeks, they start to hatch. This year, we're gonna be pretty tight with hatching. Um, egg pickup, we didn't change the egg pickup dates based on the early egg take. So your little guys will hatch pretty quick after um, egg pickup. So once they're in your tank, hopefully they hatch before Thanksgiving so that the kids can see. And then you'll have these little sack fry hanging out in your tank. Sack fry do nothing. So when these guys are laying on the bottom of your tank on their side um, doing nothing, that is normal, right? That is exactly what they should be doing because these guys are not ambitious. They don't really have developed fins yet. And that yolk sack is heavy. So in the wild, they would actually be down between the rocks in the sediment and just lay there, right? Um, and they kind of lay there and absorb their yolk sac. Every once in a while, they get ambitious and zoom around, but most of the time they just lay there. The only way you'll know if they're dead or sick is turning white. So again, white is bad. So someone just mentioned in this um, picture from the wild, a lot of those eggs are white. This is from a wild spawn. So the rate of fertilization was much lower. That's what this picture is showing. Um, so in the wild, it's not even 50% are fertilized. In um, hatchery environments, we fertilize you know, much higher to and closer to 100%. Um, so yeah, white eggs and white sack fry mean dead and get them out of there. Sometimes it looks like the bellies are squirting out like cottage cheese or something. Um, you want to get those out of there at that phase. They're not going to make it. So white is bad. Get them out of there before they start messing with your tank parameters. Someone asked to go over acclimation again. So acclimation, you are going to have that Ziploc baggie of eggs and you're gonna go back to your school right after egg pickup. So you drive to the egg pickup spot, turn around, drive back to school. Then you go in your school with that baggie of eggs, open the lid on your tank and set the baggie of eggs floating in the tank and put the lid down to pinch it from rolling around. Then after about five minutes, take like a cup of water out of, you know, like a Dixie cup of water out of the tank, unzip your bag and pour it in and then pin it again so they don't come out of the bag yet. Another five, 10 minutes later, scoop another scoop of water, add it to the bag. Five or 10 minutes later, do it again. Um, and then when the temperature of the water in the bag is the same as the temperature outside the bag, you just take your bag and dump them in. Super easy peasy. There is a video on the, if you go to that curriculum connections part of the webpage, and then the very bottom tab that said caring for your fish, there is an acclimation video. Like I said, it's retro, but it totally gets the point across. And I will be making a new one of those this year as well. But yeah, just get them so that the water is the same in the bag and outside of the bag and then drop them in. Should take you less than a half hour. You know, I, that's what I always tell teachers is like, add some water, then go, um, you know, clean your whiteboard and then go back and add some more water and like straighten up your desk and then go back and add some more water and like go straighten up some chairs, add some more water and then dump them in and then start looking for those white eggs starting the next day and just pull those out of the system. Okay, so let's go back. We have like one more slide and we'll have a break. So give me two seconds to get back to where I am at. We have like four more slides, I lied. Okay. Um, so this is 
a mandatory thing you should fill out. It's in your teacher guide. This is the um, tank maintenance chart. Once a week, you are required to record this data. So you use your water test kit, and we'll talk about those later, um, to record all this data. This can be a Google Sheet. It can be a paper one on a table, however you want to keep this data. Um, but you need to do it at least once a week. And darn slides aren't up again, even though it says they are. Let's try this again. Hopefully they appeared now. Um, but so this tank maintenance chart, it's page 27 of the guide. You can print it out and laminate it. You can print out copies and put them in like a three ring binder. I have a Google sheet of this or you can make your own. Um, and you keep this data once a week. You could do it every day. You could do it every hour of every day, however you want, but at least once a week. Um, and you never have to turn these in except if you have tank issues. So if you email me going, oh no, this is something's wrong. The first thing I'm going to ask for is, can you send me a picture of your tank and filter setups? And can you send me your tank maintenance chart so I can see the, what your water parameters are doing? Because usually between those two things, I can peg the problem right away and help you with a solution. So that is why you keep this chart. Otherwise, you never have to turn it in. But it's fun for the students to keep this data as well, and you can graph it and do all sorts of stuff. But it's mainly to keep track of the, the state of your tank and to help diagnose issues. So at least once a week, you need to fill this out. Um, so now you've got those little sack fry and they're starting to button up. So buttoned up is where, you know, you see their fins have basically developed and they've sucked up that little yolk sac in their belly and their bellies look like they literally zip up like a zipper. So it'll be kind of open, but not hanging down in orange anymore. And then all of a sudden it zips right up. When 80% of them are zipped up, buttoned up like that and swimming up in the water column, that's when you start to begin feeding. And like I said, it is literally training these little buggers. They are not good at it at first. So you put teeny tiny amounts of food in multiple times a day until they learn how to eat. Then after that, you want to feed multiple times a day for the rest of the school year. Tiny little doses of food. Um, you're literally feeding a quarter teaspoon of food at the beginning. So you, um, teeny tiny amounts of teeny tiny, you know, amount of food per day. So do it four times, five times, you know, if you have to, two times is okay. Um, but, you know, separating that feeding, what happens is, like I said, Chinook eat in the middle of the water column. So if that water drops below them before they can grab it, they're not going to go to the bottom to get it. And it just lays on the bottom and gets funky and messes up your water. So you don't want water to hit the bottom. And what I tell teachers is put a piece of masking tape on your tank 25% down from the top. So measure the height, divide it by four, and put a piece of tape, you know, four inches or five inches from the top, like it says. Don't let food go below that line um, because they're not going to eat it. It's just going to sit on the bottom. So sprinkle in food slowly enough and frequently enough that none of it goes past that line. That line also helps with water changes. And we'll talk about that later. But that 25% line, you know, 25% down from the top is an important piece. You know, so use a dry erase marker or a piece of painter's tape or whatever you might need to do and mark that spot because it helps students as well. So if you have students helping, that helps give them a visual of don't let food go below this. You're feeding too fast. Uh, the food comes in individualized Ziplocs with labels on them that specify what the size is, how big the fish should be when you're, they're eating that. And um, how often and how long you feed this food for. So each of these different bags of food are for different parts of the school year. Each size gets incrementally bigger. And Leah, our intern who's helping moderate today, she will attest to it smells super lovely. We get it in 50 pound bags and Leah and I stood in our warehouse with like one cup measuring cups and hundreds and hundreds of Ziploc bags and manually bag this for you guys and put the stickers on. Um, so you get a one gallon Ziploc with each of your sizes of food inside of it. And you also get a copy of a feeding chart. And I'll show you that in a second. Another thing I recommend is having a set of measuring spoons for only your fish food and also to get one of these vitamin trays. So these vitamin trays um, have a bunch of different slots you know, this one has four per day. That's perfect. Take your ration of food for that day. So if it says you need to feed a quarter teaspoon per day, ration that quarter teaspoon out into those four spots each day. And it keeps you on track and you know when you fed and what you fed and, you know, helps students not overfeed. So that's an important piece. 
So here's that feeding chart. And like I said, it's got everything is color coded. It's all by size. The stickers on the bags are color coded. I try to help out as much as possible. So the way it's set up is week one, you're going to feed the number one size food, eighth of a teaspoon per day, right? You're just teaching them how to eat. Now, week two, you are doing the number one size of food again, but now you're doing a quarter teaspoon per day. Week three, you jump to size number two and a little bit more. Um, the reason that doesn't have dates associated, rather, you know, it has week one, week two, week three, is because I don't know when your fish are gonna button up. It depends on your water parameters and your temperature in your tank. Colder water makes the fish develop slower. Warmer water makes them develop faster. Um, and old school teachers will tell you it was like 47, 48 degrees is what their tanks were at because they used to chill the water at Wolf Lake Hatchery. They don't anymore. So now it's 52 because it's 52 at the hatchery. Um, but they develop a little bit quicker because it's a slightly warmer temperature. So what you want to do in your notes section or even up here, so you want to write your calendar date up here of when week one was for you. So say it's December 15th is calendar date one. And then in the notes section, you want to keep track. So like maybe this first week, your note is, yeah, they didn't really figure it out. I did tiny doses, nobody ate. That's okay. Again, underfeeding is better than overfeeding. So keep that in mind. Um, feeding on weekends and holidays. Um, if you can go in, that's fabulous. We advocate for feeding late on Friday and early on Monday, and you can let the fish, fish fast over the weekend if you want to. They will be potentially smaller at the end of the year than if you fed them every day, but it won't hurt them one bit. In the wild, they're not going to necessarily find food five times a day every day of the week. So fasting is okay. So feeding late on Friday and early on Monday is fine for weekends. Um, holiday breaks or Thanksgiving breaks where you're gone for more than two days, um, you want to check on them at least every like three or four days. You want to check your test your water parameters to make sure you don't need to do a water change and you want to make sure you feed them. And again, feed them a little bit, go wash your whiteboard, come back, feed them some more, go clean something else, feed them some more, then you can leave and go home, right? Try to split up the feeding at least a little bit. Um, and you also want to siphon the water, like I said, if you have water issues and get that debris out of there. So siphoning, siphon the bottom at least once during that holiday break is a good idea. Spring break, um, now they're bigger and faster and feistier and will jump out of your tank again. Um, so having those glass lids is important, but you want to try to feed daily over spring break and siphon twice that week because they produce a lot of waste. So an easy way to do that over spring break, if you can't um, bribe coworkers or a custodian or something, is to get an Eheim filter or Eheim feeder. So this is an auto feeder, you program it and you can program it to rotate up to like four times a day. And um, this little trap door here pulls almost closed, which is basically where you want it. And what I suggest is put some food in there and test this thing over a Tupperware dish to see how much comes out and then measure what came out and make sure you're not overfeeding. Again, underfeeding is better. So underfeed um, your fish over that break, but you can, can use one of these auto feeders to kind of take some of that burden off you. Because then all you need to do is go in and make sure the auto feeder is behaving and siphon debris and waste out of your tank. So your daily and weekly tasks, again, this is gonna be posted and it's also in your manual, so don't think you have to write this all down. But daily, you wanna check for those white dead eggs or dead fish later in the year. Remove debris at the beginning of the year. It's the egg cases, the egg shells. Um, and then later it will be waste. Um, observe their behavior and then check your equipment. Again, make sure the lights are on, the bubbles are coming out of the thing, you know, do all of that. And then daily, you're gonna feed after they're buttoned up. Weekly, you need to test and record your water parameters and you need to siphon debris and exchange water. Treat your new water with prime or whatever buffers you may need if you have weird pH or hardness. And then reset your food or auto feeder if you're using one and record feeding in your food chart. Like if you move to a new size or what week you move to that size. Uh, monthly, you need to squeeze out and rinse sponge filters. Again, don't do them on the same day or even the same week, rotate. So do one now, two weeks from now, do the other one. Then two weeks from then, do the first one again. And you just squeeze and rinse those, um, preferably in a bucket of dirty tank water. But if not, you can do it under the faucet as long as you don't like get them to where they're like sterilized clean because you're killing the bacteria at that point. Um, and if you have hang on the back filters, you need to make sure you're replacing that filter material back there. And then at three months, um, it doesn't hurt to back flush your chiller, which means you just undo the hoses and actually run it um, into like a sink just to flush it out. And you can also do that with your canister filter. 
just kind of give it a once over, take it, you know, open it up, look at the filter media, make sure there's no gunk in there. Because again, you might have eggshells get in there or even dead fish and you want to get those out of there before they mess up your water parameters. And I see a question popped up, so let's look. Uh, DO water rather than tap. Um, again, you don't want to use DO water by itself, but you can use that for your water changes. Just keep an eye on your hardness and you know, make sure you still have minerals in your water. So just like using RO water, you definitely don't want to use RO water by itself. It has no minerals. So um, keep that in mind. You know, tap water is good. It's just you might have to mix it with some of that distilled or RO water.